PilotSafety.org is a volunteer group dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost safety training for pilots. Learn more now at PilotSafety.org. PilotSafety.org teaches free FAA safety classes all over the U.S. thanks to the help from our sponsors of EMCO, Avidyne, and Global Star. Our speaker today is Gary Reeves. He volunteers as a Young Eagles flight leader for the EAA. Gary has over 6,000 hours, is an ATP and a master flight instrument and multi-engine instructor. Of the 112,000 instructors in the US, less than 800 have ever been named master instructor. Gary is one of only nine to have earned this designation in Texas. He is a nationally recognized expert in Avidyne, Garmin Avionics, IFR, and Forklight. In May 2016, Avidyne selected Gary Reeves and Pilot Safety as their national training provider. In 2016, Gary was awarded the FAA Instructor of the Year for the Western Pacific region, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. This means he is one of the top eight instructors in the whole country. Please welcome 2016 Western Pacific Regional Instructor of the Year and Master CFI, Gary Reeves. How y'all doing? It's Gary. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas for the evening. This will be the last time you see me, which is, I think, plenty. You really came to learn about autopilots, and uh, that's where we're going to do. So we'll go right back to the presentation. If y'all have any questions at all, type them in the question section. I will try and answer as many as I can at the end, and uh, we'll do it that way. So I'm not going to stop during the presentation, but I'll get them at the end. And I'm going to run several polls uh, during this just to make sure I'm talking to the right people about what you really need. So I'm going to run the first poll now about do you fly with an autopilot currently? So if you can all get a chance to answer that, and then uh, let's get back to the presentation and and uh, keep going here. So in the early days of aviation, aircraft required constant attention. So really what that means is, is an aircraft was just harder to fly. So it just requires constant attention to do the basics. That's what really leads to pilot fatigue is constant attention to the basics. If I can get my slide to advance, here we go. So autopilots are actually critical to aviation safety because they reduce fatigue and allow you to look at the big picture of items. So true or false, and I've seen this in many national magazines, that pilots should hand fly more and use the autopilot less to be safer. What do you all think, true or false? Well, in my opinion, it's totally false because hand flying is harder and uses up critical gray matter to focus on stuff that I can teach any child to hold course and altitude by themselves. I have a very nice Cessna 206, and unfortunately it had no autopilot, and I did a three hour IFR cross country, dodging thunderstorms in IMC the whole way, and it was exhausting. Now, I've got 7,500 hours, I teach IFR for a living, and I was having trouble keeping my altitude within 100 feet 
and my assigned headings within five or 10 degrees because I was constantly divided. My brain was constantly divided in too many ways. Anybody can hold the wing level, anybody can track a course, and anybody can turn to a heading, but not necessarily while you're looking for traffic, looking down at four flight approach plates, adjusting knobs, changing or amending clearances, and answering busy air traffic control. So what I want you to do is be a professional pilot. And that really comes down to you having three priorities. One is the big picture. Airline pilots never hand fly except occasionally to maintain basic skills. The job of an airline captain and the job of an airline first officer is to look at the big picture. Planning ahead. You need to think 50 to 100 miles ahead of the aircraft. Much easier, especially if somebody else is flying the plane and looking outside for traffic and real-time weather. The only real-time weather is really looking outside the window or if you happen to have radar. So a professional pilot knows that an autopilot should be on 99% of the time because it allows them to do these three priorities. The first autopilot was in 1914. It's invented on June 18th, made it dis its uh, first I guess public display. It connected a gyroscopic heading indicator and an attitude indicator to hydraulically operated elevators and rudders. Hey, it was the original flyby tube. It really only permitted the aircraft to fly straight and level on a compass course, but without a pilot's attention, which means it just reduced the pilot's workload a lot. As they passed the reviewing stand, Kitchen on one wing and Sperry, as in Sperry Instruments, who invented the first autopilot, was on the other. And they stood on the wings, opposite wings, and flew by the display stand with the pilot seat totally empty. I am not suggesting you do this. This is a waiver. I have a witness in the room. I am not telling you to do this. So the difference between genius and stupidity is that genius has its limits. It's a quote from one of my favorite guys, Albert Einstein. I'm just gonna change the quote a little bit. The difference between genius and stupidity is that genius knows the limitations of their autopilot. And I actually said that. So let's look at a cap, a King Autopilot 140. And King and Century were one of the early adopters, uh, you know, the last century autopilots, as I always say, and they were very good for the time. The King Autopilots has significant limitations that most people don't know. So if anyone out there has a King Autopilot, you have to do the entire pre-flight procedure in the supplement, which most people never read. It has to be obviously off for takeoff and landing, but the maximum speed is 140 knots. Well, not too hard to maintain that in the 172, but the minimum speed is 70. Below that, the oscillations just become uncontrollable. And the minimum approach speed is 80 knots, which means you can't do an approach at 20 or more flaps. In fact, it says in the supplement that the maximum flap extension is limited to 10 degrees. And it's not allowed below 800 feet on takeoff or below 200 feet on approach. Now, most people say, well, you know, the decision height is 200 feet on most ILSs, and that's true but you can go 100 feet below minimums if you see paint pavement or lights, and it has to be hand flown, but a pretty good autopilot for when it was invented. STEC 55X, which is what is being installed in my 206, only because the 3100 hasn't been STC'd for my plane yet, but hopefully our sponsors, Genesis, hello, is anybody from Genesis listening? You can uh, get on that STC for my 206 for me. I'm putting in the 55X, it's gonna be installed in a couple weeks. It has some limitations too, and these are the limitations for the Cirrus SR22. Gotta do the entire pre-flight procedure. Has to be off for takeoff and landing. Max speed is 185 knots. And you are limited to a 12 knot maximum crosswind between the final approach fix and the missed approach point. 
So many people don't know that. So they think, well, I can land in a 15 knot crosswind. Totally true. But you can't use the autopilot inside the final approach fix if the crosswind is above 12 knots. Minimum approach speed is 1.2 times stalling speed. Maximum flap extension, 50%. Not a big limitation because in my opinion, all approaches are done at flaps 50 in a Cirrus. You never go full flaps until the autopilot's disconnected and you've seen the runway and are committed to landing. You must disconnect it any time that there's more than a 50% lateral deflection. And you can turn it on at 400 feet after takeoff, which makes it much better than the gap 140. And you can disengage it at the decision altitude. Trio Pro Pilot. This is actually uh, a really neat uh, autopilot. I think it's great. It's one of the lower cost autopilots. And there's a couple low cost autopilots available now, which I, I think is great because any autopilot is better than no autopilot in hand flying. But there are some significant limitations to the cheaper autopilots. You got to do the pre-flight procedure. You got to have off for takeoff and landing. It is GPS only. That means if there's a GPS failure or a GPS testing NOTAM, that it will not track a VOR or a localizer. You got to be in the left seat. Sorry, instructors, you can't fly the plane alone from the right. Minimum speed is 75 knots. It has a maximum fuel imbalance of 15 gallons. You have to disconnect it at 50%. And it's not allowed below 800 feet again after takeoff. Now, Garmin's recently released the G500 and G600 autopilots for uh, some planes. Doesn't have nearly as many of the STCs as the 3100 and the 55X. But there are some interesting limitations to the Garmin as well. Got to do the pre-flight test. Off for takeoff and landing, of course. And it will not work with a GTN. So if you go out and buy a very nice shiny GTN 750, and you go out and you buy a G500 autopilot, the two will not talk. They won't work at all. Unless you put in a G5 or G500, G600 display in the middle, or you buy a converter box. If you wanna work with the Garmin 43530, same thing. Either need a G5, a G500, G600, or that converter box, which is called the GAD29. So it's just kind of interesting that the best Garmin uh, GPS unit and the best Garmin autopilot actually won't talk to each other unless you buy uh, a couple more Garmins. Minimum speed, 75 knots. Maximum fuel imbalance, 15 gallons. This is for the Bonanza. You got to turn it off at 50% deflection. And you can't turn it on until 800 feet after takeoff. Um, and of course, you got to disengage it in 200 feet. Now, I actually really like the G500 and G600 autopilots. I think they're pretty neat. But the one thing that scares me is it has a built-in something that I call nanny mode. And it's called ESP. Basically, if the autopilot is turned off, you are hand flying, and you bank too much, or you pitch up or down too much, it will now turn itself on and fight you for controls and try and correct the plane back to level. And I think that's a really cool feature for a very low time pilot in the traffic pattern, because this will help prevent a stall spin. Great feature. For a professional pilot, a high time pilot, or an instructor, I'm kind of afraid of it. I don't know how many of y'all are out there are flight instructors, but you'll recognize the most dangerous thing in any airplane is two people trying to fly the same airplane because it never works out well. The problem is, is you fly an approach into a non-towered airport, you break off because somebody cuts you off and you break high and to the left to avoid somebody cutting you off because they don't have a radio, didn't know you were there, no problem. You disconnect the autopilot, you bank high into the left, nanny mode will turn itself back on and try and level the plane back towards the oncoming traffic. So you push the disconnect button and nothing happens. It actually stays engaged until you hold down the disconnect button for either five or seven seconds. Meanwhile, it's trying to turn it back towards the traffic and you're trying to turn it away. Now you can overpower it, 
but the problem is it's still going to catch people on surprise. So that's the only thing I really don't like about the G500, G600. I think they're neat autopilots, but I really don't like the nanny mode as an experienced instructor. I see the safety benefit for a very low time pilot. Other than that, not crazy about it. There's a true track vision, another good of the lower cost autopilots. Got to do the entire pre-flight procedure, course off for takeoff and landing. Again, all of the lower cost autopilots are GPS only. They cannot track VORs, they cannot track localizers. Minimum speed is 1.3 times stalling. Got to disconnect at 50% deflection and is never allowed below 700 feet in any mode. So it's very, very important if you buy a low cost autopilot like the True Track Vision, great, better than no autopilot, but you're shooting an ILS, it won't work at all. You're shooting an LPV GPS approach and in the middle of the approach at 700 AGL, you are legally required to disconnect it and do the last 500 feet hand flying. I just don't think many people know about it. 3100, this is the one I want for my airplane. Got to do the entire pre-flight procedure. Off for takeoff and landing. Maximum flap extension in the 210 is 10 degrees. Not allowed below 200 feet, which means you can actually turn it on at 200 feet after takeoff. I love that. That's the lowest of on all the autopilots when you can turn it on safely. It has envelope protection, just like the Garmin, except it doesn't turn itself on, it tells you. Now, if the envelope protection, if the autopilot is already turned on and you try and stall the plane, it'll actually turn the nose down. If you pitch the nose down, so I was delivering a Cessna 340 uh, to a client in Northern California, had a magazine art, uh, editor with me. I said, watch this. So I told it to climb at 4,000 feet per minute and I reduced the power. Because the autopilot was on, as it got close to stalling speed, it actually trimmed the nose down to prevent a stall. I said, okay. Then I told it to go down at 4,000 feet per minute and I added power. As soon as it got anywhere near redline, it would actually trim the nose back up to avoid an exceedance. But it only does that with the autopilot on. So it's never gonna fight me for controls. Minimum speed at 80 knots, it'll trim down to 90. At 190 knots, it actually trims the nose up to 185. Unusual attitude recovery. I think all of you were pretty much used to this. Disconnect the autopilot and pair power, ailerons and rudder at the same time, and then elevator. If your nose down, you're gonna slowly pull the nose up. If your nose up, you're slowly gonna push the nose down to level. That's great, unless you have one of these three autopilots, the G500, G600, the STEC 3100, or the DFC90 from Avidyne, you simply push the level button, set the power to middle, and let go. This is really cool. At a pressurized uh, Cessna 210 with the 3100 autopilot, and I put it down in a 35 degree bank and 25 degrees nose down, let it stabilize and pretty steep going down, hit the level button and it just whoop, right to level. Same thing in a Cirrus with the DFC-90, whoop, right to level. Flew a plane with the GFC-500, uh, whoop, pretty smooth right to level. So this level button on the new technology is actually really cool and I like it. That's something JFK could have used. The pre-flight check is pretty detailed. It can be up to 37 steps and is legally required on all autopilots before every flight. So this is the uh, 172R King Autopilot 140, and you can see there are a lot of steps that you have to legally go through before every flight. So let's get into actually how to intercept some courses, and I'm gonna run the next poll. So if you're planning an upgrade or you want to add an autopilot in the next year, which ones are you, uh, are, I'm sorry, are you planning to upgrade or add an autopilot in the next year? And I'll be the first one to answer it. And my answer is yes, because I'm putting this one in, the 55X in about two weeks. So showing you how to intercept the course is pretty simple. Like you're being vectored to final 
or you're flying a heading to intercept a SID or a star, all you're going to do is you're going to hold the heading mode down, and then you're going to push the nav. So go slow. I was flying with a client today. I was flying with a client today in a Columbia 3 who had a very nice uh, STEC 55, the best unit on the planet in my mind, the Avidine 550. It's a true flight management system. It's way more than just a basic GPS. And he hit heading nav at the same time and it went to nav mode. You got to go slow when you work in autopilot. So let's do it. Hold the heading, then push nav. And you'll come up with heading and nav mode. If you want to intercept an altitude, same thing. You're going to hold the vertical speed and then push altitude. Do it slow. And that's what comes up. Now, what happened to my student today is he pushed both buttons at the same time at 1,300 feet AGL on a missed approach. The micro switch registered altitude first, locked into altitude hold, deleted the vertical speed, and locked him in at 1,380, at which point he didn't know what to do. And he was so fixated on the autopilot, he didn't realize he wasn't climbing anymore with obstructions a couple miles in front of him. Disconnect the autopilot. Remember, if anything goes wrong, disconnect the autopilot. GPS steering, pretty simple. All you do is hold heading. And when you're ready to intercept the course, if you're within two dot deflection, just push the nav button twice. And that changes it to GPS steering. Now the STEC 3100 is a little more advanced. You don't have to hold stuff. It's pretty smart. It's just going to automatically do stuff. You can just push one button at a time. So I'll turn it on. All three modes automatically come on. Now it's automatically in roll and pitch. So I push heading, then I push nav. It knows to intercept the nav course. I can set my vertical speed to 500 feet per minute up, pre-select an altitude. And then if I push altitude, it would automatically capture that altitude. So what is exactly the difference between nav and GPS steering. Well, nav mode is what we used to use on VORs, Victor Airways, localizer approaches, stuff like that. What you do is you fly by a waypoint and then the autopilot corrects back. So it'll go past NILS and then turn back at a 30 degree intercept and track the course inbound. Now, approach mode it's still going to pass and correct back, but instead of a 30 degree intercept, most good autopilots will do a 15 degree intercept. So it's still going to pass by nils, but then a much lower intercept angle. So approach mode is great because it dampens down how sharp it turns. Just like if you're training a new student, they go, they sword fight with a localizer, or they sword fight with the course, they overcorrect. To prevent overcorrection of the autopilot, that's what approach mode does. Now, GPSS, a lot of people have heard about, well, there's a silent U or silent Y in a word. GPSS actually has an invisible R. It really stands for GPS roll steering. Now, what it does is it calculates a turn initiation point to fly from the center line of the current leg to the center line of the new leg, enabling the autopilot to lead the turn. The old Bendix King KLN 89Bs, 94 GPSs, actually had a precursor of it. They kind of invented something called turn anticipation. Well, that was a very rough early mode of GPS roll steering. So the advantage of roll steering is that it's a much smoother transition because it eliminates the need to set course arrow or heading by the leg changes and it leads the turn. It's a much smoother transition.
In fact, if you put it back in GPS on the missed approach, GPS S or GPS steering, and uh, remember all Garmin navigators locked up at the missed approach point, they turn into flying bricks. You have to unsuspend and turn it back to GPS. Avidyne, of course, being a flight management system, automatically auto switches back to GPS. So on the missed approach is pretty simple. Disconnect the autopilot, full power prop mixture, seven to 10 degrees nose up, positive rate of climb, gear up, at 500 AGL with most autopilots, heading, vertical speed, altitude hold, because it's pre-selected to go straight and climb to the missed approach altitude. Or if you have a 3100, you can turn it on immediately at 200 feet AGL. And then confirm that the GPS is either auto sequenced for Avidyne or that you've pushed two buttons on a Garmin. The GPS is now back up and then switch to GPS steering and it will now automatically do the hold for you. I was flying a plane a couple days ago in Houston with a Century 4 autopilot. Now I gotta tell you, Century autopilots were really good for the day. I call them last century and I kind of make fun of them, but they were really good and this one was actually pretty tight. But in every procedure turn and in every hold, because it did not have GPS steering, you actually need to go back to heading mode and manually do procedure turns and holding patterns in heading mode, which is still easier than hand flying. So let's talk about some approach pro tips. At step one, down at the initial approach fix of 50, you should be in GPS steering, vertical speed negative 800, and be descending to an altitude hold of 3000. Let's say you were at 4,000, and when you, at this point, you were clear for the approach, you descend to 3,000. Now, of course, GPSS will lead the turn. So once you're inside the intermediate fix of Hobney, you should still be in GPSS, vertical speed negative 800, now going down to a pre-selected altitude of 2,000, which is shown on the chart. Anytime you are at or above the glide path in this course, or uh, in this case, you're gonna be level of 2000. If you're at the appropriate altitude anywhere outside of final approach fix, you should change it to approach mode with altitude hold. That should arm glide slope. Now, glide slope and glide path are the same. In a KAP 140, it will not see a GPS glide path, even if you have a G1000. It simply doesn't see GPS glide path. Most other ones, um, if you have a GTN or an Avidyne or anything, um, you can trick the autopilot into seeing it. Of course, the Garmin autopilot and of course all the STECs see a GPS glide path as the same thing. But make sure glide slope, or in this case glide path, is turned on. You're gonna set the bugs for the missed approach, which is a heading of 359, altitude to 3,000 and vertical speed of 500. It, I never want you to set the altitude bug to your decision altitude or your MDA because it doesn't matter. Once an autopilot is tracking a glide slope or glide path, it ignores altitude bugs and will fly through them anyway. So what I want you to do is I want you to set the altitude, the vertical speed and the heading to start the missed approach. At 2000, pretty close to the final approach fix of CUDAD, approach glide slope should capture. You simply reduce power and descend. At the MDA on this one, a minimum descent altitude, at position six, you're going to then disconnect the autopilot, add power, and fly level to the Mr. Approach point. That's an MDA, and that's a big difference between this approach being LNAV only. Now, the Garmin and the Avidyne units will create LNAV plus V. They'll still create that glide slope, but there is no decision altitude. You need to level off and then fly forward to the missed approach point as shown by the number seven. At the missed approach point, disconnect the autopilot again. I want that habit of when you go miss, disconnect. It's already disconnected. I want you to confirm it. Go full power, prop mixture and pitch up seven to 10 degrees. Autopilot on in heading mode, vertical speed with altitude capture at 500 feet AGL if you have an STEC 55X, 500 feet if you have a Garmin 500, 
uh, 800 feet if you have one of the cheaper, lower cost versions, or if you have the 3100, you can do it immediately because you'll already be at 200 AGL. Confirm GPS mist is on the navigator, and then activate GPS steering, and it'll automatically fly the hold. Now, if you want to be a super pro tip, we're going to do something very similar, and we'll see if you all notice the difference. While I'm doing that, I'm going to run another poll. If you are considering upgrading or adding an autopilot, which ones are you considering? <clears throat> and I actually considered all of these. So the approach Super Pro does something just very slightly different on this LNAV plus V approach. Outside of 50. You're going to be, let's say you're level at 4,000. So when you get to 50, if you've been cleared for the approach, you should be in GPS steering, vertical speed negative 800, and an altitude pre-select of 3,000. And then you just don't go down to 2,000. There is no reason to descend from 3,000 to 2,000 be inside of Hobme. 2,000 outside of QDAD, if you look at the profile above GPS vertical speed, negative 800, does not say you're supposed to be at 2,000. That's simply not true. It's at or above 2,000 at any altitude that you can capture the glide slope. So I never do that second step down. It reduces my workload a lot, and it's absolutely not necessary. The only reason you need to step down again is if you're above the glide path. But if you're above the glide path that close to final, I would actually consider asking ATC that I'm not stabilized and I'd like vectors back off course to get stabilized and then send me back to the course. If I'm fast and high, I don't want to continue the approach. Did this in Chino with a client, uh, Chino, California, I actually traveled the country teaching clients all over the country. And I was in Southern California a couple weeks ago and the controller because they were busy, put me on an approach very similar to this, a thousand feet high at the final approach fix. There was no way I could get down to capture the glide slope. So I simply told the controller, I'm too high to continue the approach. I'd like vectors back so I can be safe and do a stabilized approach. They weren't mad, they weren't upset, they just gave it to me. I was flying with another client uh, about a week ago and the controller put me at a 90 degree angle to a final approach course while they were doing parallel simultaneous approaches with a 737 on the other runway, forgot about me, and I asked him, is this going to take me across final? And he's like, oh, no, uh, turn right and intercept. By the time I got the turn right intercept, I was already through the final, and he got kind of cranky. He's like, well, it looks like you've flown through the localizer. I said, well, you gave me a late turn. Well, he stopped being cranky because I called him on it. It's not about who's right and who's wrong. But remember, you are legally obligated to ask if the course looks like it's going to take you across final. And they're legally obligated to tell you if it does. So if you're not stabilized, don't continue. Break off and come back when it's safe. So at any rate, let's go back to this one. So it's step one. I'm going to descend to 3,000. I'm just going to stay there. As soon as I'm inside Hobme, I'm going to activate approach mode. I'll be in altitude hold and glide slope is armed. I'm going to set the bugs for the missed approach, which is the 359, climb to 3,000 and a vertical speed of 500. And I'm going to intercept the glide path farther outside QDAD because I'm higher. As soon as it captures, I'm going to reduce power to track down. As soon as I get to the minimum descent altitude, disconnect my autopilot, add power up, fly the plane level. At the missed approach point, going to disconnect the autopilot again. I know it's already off, but it never hurts to double check. At full power, prop mixture, pitch up 7 to 10 degrees. And then again, depending on your autopilot, 3100, you can engage immediately. 55X, you can turn on at 400 feet. Uh, most other autopilots, you can turn at five. And the lower cost autopilot, you have to wait until you're 700 feet before you engage autopilot in heading, vertical speed, 
and altitude capture. Confirm GPS is missed on the navigator and you're back unsuspended if you have a Garmin and you're back in GPS if you have a Garmin. Again, Avidyne does both things automatically for you and then re-engage GPS steering in the autopilot and go out and do the hold for you. All right, you guys ready for the final test? It's gonna be hard. If an autopilot disconnects during an approach, you should A, go missed, or B, hand fly the approach. Absolutely go missed. If anything goes wrong in an approach, break off, get restabilized, and then if you want to come back and hand fly the approach, you can. But never try and save a bad approach. To be legal, autopilot manuals, A, need to be in the airplane. B, manuals and supplements must be in arm's reach of the pilot at all times, or C, electronic copies on an iPad are fine. Let's actually B and C. The autopilot manual in the back of the airplane makes the entire airplane unairworthy. All manuals and supplements for every avionics installed in the airplane must be within arm's reach of the pilot at all times. I just keep electronic copies in my foreflight for every plane I fly. True or false, all autopilots track GPS, VOR, and localizer approaches. False. True or false, all approach capable autopilots should be used down to decision altitude. False. Some of the low cost autopilots you have to disconnect at 700 feet, even on an, uh, an LPV approach. They won't fly in ILS at all. So what really makes an autopilot dangerous is only if the pilots aren't trained in all the limitations, they don't do the full and complete pre-flight inspection, and they just don't know how to use it. An autopilot always makes you safer if you know how to work it and recognize quickly when something goes wrong. So let's look at a couple of examples of when pilots weren't trained. Here's a crash where a medical study revealed that each of the four people killed, the fatally injured occupants, su sustained severe traumatic injuries, bad things. Although the autopilot switch was found in the on position at the accident site, the autopilot was not likely engaged as the autopilot ground track and altitude varied consistent with the hand pilot hand flying the airplane. So just because the autopilot on switch is on, doesn't mean it's engaged. You've got to know your autopilots. Exchange of flight controls. Anybody who's ever taken flight uh, instruction knows the human version. You have the plane. I have the plane. You have the plane. It's always a three-part exchange. I want you to do that same verbal exchange. Say it out loud every time you let the robot fly it. So when your robot pilot is turned on, you say autopilot on autopilot tracking in GPS steering, vertical speed mode, altitude is armed, or autopilot on, autopilot tracking in heading mode, nav mode is armed, altitude hold. So say verbally that it's on, that it's tracking, and what modes it's on. So you're all pretty familiar with a BF Gumps checklist probably. B is boost pump. And you should do this in every phase of flight. CBF Gumps or BF Gumps, some version of this works for every airplane. Last year, I trained people in, I don't know, 24 different states and 26 different types of airplanes. Everything from 172 up to beach 1900s. This checklist or some version of it works in all of them. Climb, cruise, descent, before approach, approach, landing checklist, after landing, before takeoff. This checklist works on almost all of them. Flaps, are they set to where you want them? So in the Columbia 300 for approach checklist, you want them at 50% takeoff. Gas should be on the fullest tank. The undercarriage in the Columbia 3 was welded. Mixture set for approach. Power in the Columbia 3 with flaps 50, if you ever want to know, should be at 17 inches with a prop 25. So if you have the flaps to 50, power to 17 inches and the prop to 25, that'll give you 120 knots in any Columbia 3. You're flying an SR-22, 
Same thing, except you're going to need 21 inches and 25 to hold your level at 110 knots. Pitch, is it doing what you expected to do? Source, are you getting GPS or VLOC? Who is steering the plane? Is it the human? Or if it's auto, which modes is auto in? So what happens when pilots are using checklist? Or what happens when pilots aren't using checklist is what this slide should be named. The pilot reported that he must have bumped the autopilot off when he was doing this because when he looked forward to check for traffic, he noticed that the airplane was approaching the ground. The airplane then struck trees and a fire ensued, which resulted in substantial damage to the airframe. So he didn't know that the autopilot was off. How about this story? The pilot informed the controller that he could not disengage the autopilot. He then informed the controller that it took full forward and back control pressure to descend and climb because this is what scares me about the nanny mode. The autopilot and the pilot, two different people, a one people and one robot, were fighting each other. This is what scares me. He solicited advice from another pilot on the frequency on how to turn off the autopilot. He truly was not trained in his autopilot. The advice included pulling the autopilot circuit breaker, which the pilot said he did. But the pilot apparently did not consult the emergency procedures for the autopilot pitch trim value function, which, by the way, included a step to manually retrim the airplane. And it was in the supplement and the autopilot uh, POH. The other pilot then suggested powering down the airplane, meaning he wanted the pilot to turn off the electrical power. Unfortunately, the accident pilot at this point just reduced the power setting. So what are the four easiest ways to kill an autopilot? Push an autopilot disconnect switch. If that didn't work, you can always pull the circuit breaker. If that doesn't work, turn your avionics switch off. But you know what will always work no matter what? Turn the master switch off. I promise you that will disconnect any autopilot no matter what the problem is. Of course, then you're going to need to manually retrain the airplane to do what you want it to do. So who's the best? Well, it really depends on your airplane. It really does and what other stuff you have in the airplane. I will tell you, I went with Genesis because they've got over 40 years of experience. They're out there in 40,000 airplanes. They have the most STCs, and they're the easiest upgrade, which means if you have any STEC autopilot in there, the new 3100 uses the same servos. I got to tell you, that really reduces labor and install time. Of course, it does GPS and localizer, and it works with any avionics. You don't have to have Garmin for it to work. So that's what I want for my airplane. I settled for the 55X, uh, but hey, just in case anybody at Genesis, if you're on, maybe you can work on the STC for my 206. But the most important thing is it really doesn't matter what autopilot you buy and what autopilot you think is best for you as long as you become an expert at all of your avionics, including the autopilot. I would be totally unemployed, and by the way, pretty happy about it, if everybody would simply read their complete pilot's guide, including the autopilot supplements and operating handbook, multiple times go through with a highlighter and take notes. Well, if you're not big on reading operating handbooks written by engineers, I, I understand some of them are just a little bit dry. Good news for you. Genesis actually just picked, well, hey, me, as their official training pilot, which means within the next six months, there will be free video on all Genesis autopilots. In fact, one of them is already up. If you simply go over to pilotsafety.org, click on the autopilots button, a copy of this webinar will be up sometime tomorrow, and a free STEC 3100 training video. And uh, in January, the 55X, and then in the months after that, we'll have the 20, 30, 40, 60, and all the other great ones.
That's pretty impressive to me because Genesis actually sought me out so more pilots would be trained. I really appreciate a company that really cares enough about pilots to, to make training a little bit easier. Hey, don't forget, after you've read all the autopilots and or watched a free video from Genesis, you gotta read the 383 page guide to four flight. However, if you're just not big on reading that. It makes sense to keep LAX as my emergency procedure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to there's a guy like me who actually has a four flight mastery training again over on pilotsafety.org. And what's really interesting about all my training videos, they're all real in flight footage, limited simulator use, which means if we're in turbulence, the camera shakes a little bit, but the G1000, the most complicated GPS glass display ever invented is six and a half hours. The four flight video is eight and a half and rapidly approaching nine because four flight is more complex. It's the most complex glass panel system because it has the most features. You can even get a legal pre-departure clearance and digital ATIS on it now. But again, you gotta know how to work it. By comparison, the Avidyne, an advanced flight management system, which does all of the stuff for you, is only three and a half hours. And we have some good IFR stuff if anybody would like one. Hey, if you really wanna have fun, got an offer for you, come hang out with me for three days in Dallas-Fort Worth. We're going to use my airplane, so you don't have to bring an airplane. We're going to do 18 hours plus of ground and flight training. And I got to tell you, when you fly a 206 into Dallas-Fort Worth Airport on an RNAV or ILS to 18 Center or uh, one of the, the other runways, I got to tell you, going back home, any airspace will be pretty easy after landing at DFW. Of course, since this is a recording and a webinar, I just only imagine that all of you are applauding and I really appreciate that. <laughs> Wanna thank Genesis uh, Aerosystems for making this webinar possible. They actually uh, make all of these webinars and there's gonna be one a month in the future free webinar on multiple topics because Genesis Aerosystem actually pays uh, a lot of money for their go-to webinar subscription and lets us use it. So thank you very much. If you want any question on them, just go over to genesis-aerosystems.com. Anybody near Florida in February? I would love to see you. If you know the king of check ride training, Jason Chappert at M0A, and me, who's really good at single pilot IFR, avionics, four flight, and autopilots, why don't you come join us at uh, Aviation Mastery? It's a two-day special event. We'd love to see you. A lot of details. And if you want information on any of this stuff, I'd like you to go to pilotsafety.org. You can click on Aviation Mastery. If you want to see this webinar and the free STEC 3100 training video, you can click on Autopilots. If you want information on our video mastery training, you can click on Videos. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm gonna stick around for just a few minutes and open up uh, the questions and see if I can answer any questions. If you all wanna disconnect and go do family stuff or whatever, thanks so much for uh, coming. You know, it means a lot to me that almost 500 people attended tonight. We're gonna to get you all your FA safety credits for watching the live version um, and we should have them for you uh, within the next two days. So just check your email. But it means a lot to me that you take time out just to be safer. So let's look at some questions and see if I can answer any of them. So this is from Trent Bachman. Hey, Trent. My 182S is equipped with a CAP 140 altitude hold unit. I recently installed a roll converter. And since doing so, the unit will no longer capture and fully couple an ILS. Any thoughts? Yeah, Trent, you, you got to go back to the shop that installed it something is blocking the ILS signal or interfering with that. So unfortunately, there's nothing I can kind of fix over the webinar, but you got to pretty much just get closer to the, uh, um, you, you got to simply go to the avionics shop. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. 
Dennis Malloy, is the 200 feet limitation on approach for IFR only, or does it apply to VFR landings as well? I'm assuming you're talking to the STEC 3100. It applies to any type of approach 200 feet. I use my autopilot on a VFR landing. I would, uh, this is only a personal recommendation. I disconnect once I'm in the traffic pattern. But uh, no, it's 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 not for IFR, it's, it's any time. And Ernie Senator, and many people are saying hi and great webinar and all that. And I certainly appreciate that. Um, Ernie Senator, I'm sorry if I messed your name, uh, is just simply agreeing that the supplement does show all of the restriction I was talking about. Carlos Barroso, sorry if I messed up that name. Why wouldn't you use GPS steering all the time instead of nav? Well, I do. I think the autopilot should be on as soon as possible after takeoff and not messed with until decision altitude or minimum decision altitude on an IFR approach. And I think you should always go GPS. But if there's a GPS failure and you need to track a Victor or a jet route, then of course only nav would work because GPS worked for. Uh, Thomas Bell, hey Thomas Bell. GPSS actually stands for GPS Guided Roll Steering, R-O-L-L, -L, meaning it rolls the turn before. Okay, I'm just scrolling through here. So to prepare for a go-around is best practice on approach to have full prop. Personal preference, uh, most of the time I like 25 inches in controllable pitch props, but it really is kind of a personal preference. It's totally up to you. In a G1000, this is from Daniel Switkin. Hey, Daniel. In a G1000 airplane, can you explain the differences between the CAP 140 and the GFC 700? I rent DA40s and fly both. Yeah, simple. Uh, the GFC 700 is a much better autopilot because it's fully integrated into the G1000, which means you set an altitude bug, a heading bug on the G1000, and it automatically flies it. You don't have to double data entry. And the CAP 140 is not, uh, not able to fly an LPV glide path or an LNAV plus V glide path. The GFC 750 is. Dite, how you doing, buddy? Uh, one of my very good friends, Dite Steinruck, is saying hi from Texas. Uh, <laughs> George Macedo says he wants a Gary robot next to me when I fly. I'm happy to do that. I can come out to you. I'm I'm two thousand dollars a day, so I would suggest you just simply just buy an S stack. I think they're cheaper. R C Grensick. I'm sorry, I'm messing these names up. I'm sure. I fly with an S Tech 50. I'd like to jump up to the 3100, but it's not currently legal. Can an avionics shop install a 3100, expecting that the autopilot will be approved in the future? No, um, it, they can only legally install it in an airplane with an STC. Dave Stamp, you got a great question, and I really thank you for asking this. Dave asks, how many people do you really think do the pre-flight check on autopilots? Very few, very few. In fact, uh, I train clients all over the country and the first day I watch them do a pre-flight and the first day I let them do the run-up on their own. And I've never had one do the full legally required autopilot pre-flight inspection. And it's not really their fault. The instructors before me didn't know either and nobody ever told them they had to do it. So it's not really their fault. Even the instructors they had before didn't know. Now all you know, all 500 of you tonight, so please go share. Thanks, Dave, for asking that. Uh, Thomas Bell, what is the aircraft uh, that we use for training in the DFW three-day mastering IFR program? Oh, the very nice Cessna 206 with an Avidyne 550, 440, adds B in and out, an STEC 55X autopilot, and an Aspen panel. It's a, a great airplane to get really good at IFR. So Paul Chetham asked, can you comment on the difference between the Avidyne DFC-90 versus the STEC-3100? If you have an airplane 
that has Avidyne equipment installed and previously has the STEC 55X, it, the DFC90 is literally a plug and play replacement. A 3100 is a different type of install. So I actually love the DFC90. It's a very good autopilot, but it's kind of limited to about four airframes. And you have to have the 55X previously installed. So one of the airframes uh, the Avidyne DFC90 is approved for is the PA32. Most of you know is a Piper Saratoga. So somebody with a Piper Saratoga, an Avidyne PFD and an MFD, which by the way, were invented five years before a G1000. They were the first class display with an Avidyne 550, 440 ads being and out. And an old King Autopilot said, I want to upgrade to the DFC90. No, just go get the STEC 3100. Because to install the DFC90, he would have to pay for and install a complete STEC 55X throw away the 55X and then replace it with the DFC-90. So if you have an Avidyne equipped airplane in four different airplane models, I believe, and I'm thinking it's the 182, the Bonanza, the PA-32 and the Saratoga, if you have a 55X, upgrading to the DFC-90 makes a lot of sense. If you're not in one of those four airframes or you don't have the 55X, which is most of you or any STEC autopilot, upgrading to the 3100 is probably better. Perry Marshall asked a question, will I still come to uh, your location to do a three-day training program? Yes, I will, and just reach out to me for details. Uh, David Spurlock asked a question, hey David, uh, how much value can be gained from a three-axis autopilot? The more the autopilot can do for you, the more workload it reduces, and I think it's safer. David Christian asked a great question for us VFR guys is learning an autopilot still worth the effort. Yeah, because VFR people, I want you on the autopilot full time too, because I want your head outside the window, not trying to track a heading or an altitude. I want you to look outside for, for traffic. Walter Slocomb. Hi, Walter. I'm about to start instrument rating training. Great. You'll love it and it makes you much safer. My plane has an STEC 50, great autopilot, and a Garmin 430 Wasp. Great. What would GPS steering add? So you can actually add GPS steering to the STEC 50, and that does the roll steering. That would automatically do holds, procedure turns, and fine, uh, a finer job of, of shooting the GPS approach. So it is available from Genesis and just reach out to your dealer. <laughs> Dennis will uh, Dennis, you make me laugh, ha ha ha. He says, I include in the passenger briefing the fact that my KAP makes a loud screaming beeping sound on disconnect. It's always good to warn your passengers before loud screaming beepings happen. Uh, Edward Cohen, do I have a training course for the CAP 140? No, I don't. Hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have a short version up on that autopilot guide for you. Uh, Enrique, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to make it mess it up. Enrique M. Mouchant, I'm sorry if I messed that up. Enrique asks, I have a 182H with an Avidyne IFD 540, excellent, and an Aztec 30 with GPS steering and altitude hold. I missed the first first 15 minutes. Um, so what's a better upgrade for you, the Avidyne or the STEC 3100? You would actually have to go the 3100. The Avidyne DFC90 is a plug and play replacement for the 55X only. So it wouldn't make sense for you to upgrade to a 55X, then throw it away and buy the DFC90. I think you're much faster, cheaper going to the 3100. Uh, where's the best place to find STEC 55X and GFC 500 integration capability from Christopher? Well, we'll have a 55X uh, video up for free by the end of January on pilotsafety.org and you just click on autopilots. Uh, Steven Dixis, hi Steven. Do I have an online reference source for more information about the CAP 140? No, but if you just Google CAP 140 operating handbooks, you'll find it. J.S. Lowry. Hi, J.S. Hold on just a second, guys. I'm going to take a drink of water. I so apologize. My voice tends to fade a little bit after an hour. J.S. Lowry. Lowry, sorry. 
can you discuss limitations to autopilot glide slope capture outside the final approach fix? Not, there isn't really a limitation to the autopilot glide slope capture because it depends on what altitude you're at. So it's not a, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, so he's asking how long do I have to be stabilized on a localizer before a glide slope will engage? Well, that totally depends on the autopilot. Um, the really good ones, you just only have to be two or three seconds. Uh, Bill Hagen. Hi, Bill. Uh, the 182 I rent has a last century 200A Navomatic autopilot. Is it worth learning to use it? Yes, because you need to know what it will do and the limitations. Um, a better idea would be to convince the flight school to upgrade the autopilot. But yeah, anytime any autopilot, including a Century autopilot, which by the way, were great for their time. If it's got an autopilot, you need to know how to work it. Uh, several people say thank you, totally appreciate it. So Casey Dudenhofer, Hofer, I'm sorry about that, Casey. Uh, is the STEC 3100 really worth three to four times the price of the Vision? I, I think it's all personal decision. It is to me, and, and the reason I'm putting in an STEC 55X in my 206, which is uh, more than a true track Vision, is because I think it's safer having an autopilot with envelope protection, level mode, and contract GPS and VR localizers. So in my personal opinion, I want an autopilot that has all the capabilities, not some of them. But that's a totally personal decision. And it really depends on your budget a lot too. Any autopilot is better than no autopilot. So it's really a matter of, uh, I guess, credit card limits and how much you got in savings. Ken Norris, G1000 with the GFC 700 uh, autopilot. If the autopilot is set for approach and I set the missed altitude, won't I get the audio alert saying altitude when you go below it? Yep, you just ignore it. William Davis, hey buddy, I have an STEC 30 with altitude hold, but doesn't capture approaches with a 300 XL. Any thoughts? Uh, the STEC 30 should track GPS courses. I would talk to uh, your avionics shop on that. I, I think there's something you need to have tuned up there, buddy. And I'm missing some of these. I do apologize. Uh, Y'all can always email me if you go to pilotsafety.org and hit contact. You can send me an email if I don't, if I don't get your question. Are all autopilots capable of intercepting the glide slope from above? No, um, the STEC 3100 will if you simply push the glide slope button a second time, but I don't recommend it. I actually recommend if you're high above the glide slope to either descend to a safe, stable altitude and intercept from below, or if you're high on uh, really close to final, I, I recommend you break off and do a missed approach. Uh, okay, Ruben, hey Ruben. STEC on a Kodiak 100 inadvertently disconnected the climb mode while leaving FXE. I'm assuming that's an airport or VR. And then I, I then realized I was level. Why did it happen? The most common error, and obviously I wasn't in the plane with you, but the most common error is that people have either pre-selected uh, the incorrect altitude or while instead of holding vertical speed down and then slowly pushing out to do capture, they try and do both buttons at the same time and accidentally engage altitude hold. Uh, Carl Miller has a great note. Hey, Carl. The Garmin 480 does support auto switching at the missed approach point without locking up or suspending like a Garmin 430 and 530, uh, the G1000 and the G50, GTN 650 and 750. You know, that's absolutely correct, Carl, because the Garmin 480 is a true flight management system, which was not made by Garmin. It's actually a purchase technology that was originally invented by UPS, as in the people who bring your brown packages. What is the, uh, Will Schmidt, hey Will, 
what is the reason for minimum autopilot minimums? What's the potential risk or what could go wrong? And I, I think what you mean is the minimum altitude you can turn it on at or the uh, minimum altitude you have to turn it off at on approaches. Well, the potential risk is that it could overcorrect or something could go wrong. So when autopilots are certified, the manufacturer actually does flight testing. And what are they willing to guarantee? So the STEC 3100, all the way down to 200 feet, because it's an all digital, very fine autopilot. TrueTrack Vision, a very good autopilot. I like TrueTrack, I think they're a great company, but a much lower cost. You have to turn it off at 700 feet on approach because it doesn't have that fine a motor control when they're just not certified. So it's all about safety. Jeff Hampton, hey buddy. Uh, uh, and uh, Ravon, uh, everybody should hate Ravon a little bit. Apparently he's hanging out in Hawaii while doing this. Richard Chapman, hi Richard. I have an AFS system, that's the advanced flight system display. Uh, they recently got purchased by Dynan, 5,000 in the true track, private label to AFS, along with a GTN 650. Most controls on the EFIS do I have any training for this combination? Video training, no, uh, just because it's kind of a rare combination, but I could do a three-day program for you if you wanted me to come out to you. Uh, Dustin, do I have a tutorial on the Garmin GFC 500 Autopilot? Not yet, I'm hoping to by Sun and Fun. It'll be a combination DVD of G5, G500, G600 display and G500, G600 Autopilot with a little bit about the G5. So check with me at Sun and Fun, by the way. Uh, Ryan McFarland, he lives in DFW. Hey, Texan, good to see y'all. Uh, simply go over to pilotsafety.org and uh, click on uh, IFR. No, I'm sorry, you know what, Ryan? To get information about the three-day class, go to masterflighttraining.com. Masterflighttraining.com for Ryan. Uh, good to see a fellow Texan. Chris Diensro. Hi, Chris. Why are no autopilots self-checking? They are computerized. Well, some actually have um, an autopilot test button, but you're not checking uh, response to heading and vertical speed commands, uh, which are manual inputs from the pilot, and that's why they require it. Uh, where does the STEC 50, uh, this is from Will Schmidt again, hey Will. STEC 55, get the attitude information. Well, it's coming from the turn coordinator, um, which is the difference between the 55X and the 3100, which is all digital. So what failures in an SR20 could send bad inputs to the autopilot? Well, uh, a turn coordinator, a vacuum failure, um, or most turn coordinators are actually uh, electric driven, I would think. So a failure of the turn coordinator or a failure of the electrical system could cause problems. Peter Lazar, hi Peter. I have a Century uh, 2B autopilot. How good is it? Came with plain one about it. I think the Century 2B is a really great autopilot for something that's invented in the 80s uh, or maybe even late 70s, I'm not sure. I think it's a really good autopilot. The problem is, is the servos get out, the unit gets a little old. Um, there is Century autopilots still at Mineral Wells and there's a company called Autopilot Central in Oklahoma City that is really good about tuning those things up if you if you need to tune it up. I think it's a great autopilot. Uh, of course, it's not going to track a GPS glide path. It's not going to have GPS steering. Uh, James Harris says the true track vision in experimental aircraft also tracks VOR and ILS. I did not know that. Hey, and I got Enrique's last name right. David Sprock. Hey, David, I know you. I'm installing an Avidine 550. Great job. It's the best flight management system available, way more than a, a basic GPS. And thought I was going to install a true track vision, but I didn't realize it was so deficient. So I want to be very clear. I don't think the true track vision is a bad autopilot. It just doesn't have all the capabilities that the S Tech 55X or 3100 have. And uh, I believe he's saying that he's going to sell the neighbor's kid, in which case maybe sell both of the neighbor's kid and at least get a 55X. Good to talk to you, David. Uh, nice seeing you again. 
or at least seeing you on chat. Arlene Alexander, hey Arlene, we have an STEC 30 autopilot. How difficult is it to upgrade to a 3100? Well, I don't actually work for Genesis and I'm certainly not an installer. I'm a great master flight instructor. Installation and engineering is way beyond my skill set. But from what I've heard, it's actually really easy and much cheaper than installing a different autopilot because it's going to use all the same servos you already have in there. Okay, at this point, I'm going to answer one more question from Don Morrow. I apologize, everybody. My voice is just kind of going out. I'm at an hour 21, and I've, I was teaching in Columbia all day. So I'm going to answer one more question from Don Morrow. And then if everybody who did not get their question answered will go over to pilotsafety.org and click on Contact Us, which I'm sure is there somewhere. Um, you can actually send me an email if I didn't get your question, and I'll get back to you within 48 hours. So Don Morrow, last question, buddy. Uh, congratulations, you win. I have a DA-40, wonderful plane, with a G-1000 and a Cap-140 autopilot. It will not do a full standard rate turn in either nav or heading mode. The turn coordinator has been overhauled, but the problem remains. Any ideas what could be wrong as I still overshoot turns and localize or capture? You know, you might need to overhaul the autopilot itself, and I don't know a great company that works on King Autopilots. I'm sure there are some. I just don't know them. So I would actually ask uh, your avionics shop who the best person for King Autopilots is. Yeah, it's something wrong. Uh, your servos may be getting a little slack, a little run out, um, and uh, they may just need to overhaul the servos. I'm not real sure, buddy. I would check with the King Autopilot. And uh, last question, because it's on my screen. I, everybody I know it said Don was last. But Paul Chetham, uh, last question, because it's on my screen. Does the s -Tech 3100 have a VNAV mode? Well, it doesn't have VNAV currently, but they have the capabilities to add it in the future. And I know they're actively considering it and actively working on a possible way to do that. So it has the capability of doing VNAV. The biggest challenge is the GPS units sending information, how they send that VNAV out. So a Garmin, when it sends VNAV data out, sends it totally different than an Abidine. And anything going through an Aspen or a G5 changes it even more. So the, it's not that it can't do VNAV, they're, the challenge they're working on, and I, I know they're working on it uh, very hard, is trying to get it so it'll work with any avionics. That's the one of the other things I like so much about Aztec versus uh, the Garmin. I love Garmin. I think Garmin's a great company, and they make wonderful products. But Garmin tends to only work with Garmin. Aztec wants to work with everybody. They want to be a solution for all pilots, not just those who install Garmin equipment. So, guys, my voice is done. I am kind of losing quickly. Thank you again so much for sticking in to the very, very end. A recording of this will be up by tomorrow evening on pilotsafety.org autopilots. If I didn't get to your question, go to pilotsafety.org, hit contact us and send it to me. Y'all are the best part of flying for me. Anybody who'll take two hours out of their evening to attend a, a safety class is kind of my hero. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, everybody for uh, tuning in. Thanks again to Genesis for providing us with the webinar capabilities. And we've got another one coming up on what date? December 13th. So uh, December 13th, we have another one uh, coming up. So just check my website for details and we'll see y'all really soon. Thanks again.